We have uh, uh, Dr. Frauko Jogosen, who is a senior lecturer in music, music but her specialty is in uh, early music and uh, computational musical musicology, which is, sounds very complex, but probably she will tell us more about it. So, uh, uh, so we have uh, three questions. Uh, let's start uh, by asking uh, that you you do teach one course in this academy year for uh, incoming MMA students. Could you tell us more about the course? Okay, so the course I teach for uh, uh, for postgraduate students and for fourth year students in the upcoming year is Renaissance Counterpoint. And uh, that sounds extremely specialized. It's sort of uh, if you're a composer coming into, into this degree, you might think, why should I be thinking about composing in a style of uh, four or 500 years ago? And if I want to be a, an ethnomusicologist or a performer, why would this interest me uh, at all? And so I'm here to tell you about just, um, just how many aspects this course can touch on. So in Renaissance Counterpoint, we learn a style of composition um, that at the time was actually taught to, uh, to children hmm. initially through the, uh, through the act of learning how to improvise. And then, uh, and then later on, once they had learned how to do basic improvisation in the style, then they would learn how to actually write pieces. Um, so we learn how to handle musical materials in a really, really controlled environment, and especially to think about how we balance horizontal and vertical aspects of the piece, because that's what counterpoint is really all about, um, in order to put together a convincing, a rhetorically convincing piece of music. Um, so all of these are skills that composers in whatever genre actually have to think about. You have to think about it as an electronic composer. You have to think about it as an analog composer. Uh, you have to think about it as an analyst of music. And actually, as a performer, you also have to think about it because you have to think about how to rhetorically present a piece. Yeah, I think the, uh, this is uh, uh, quite, uh, quite interesting. I remember... Uh, when I was doing my PhD, then my supervisor, of course, the, you know, the um, his specialty in electronic music, and uh, as I, uh, as uh, as as mine is, and we talked about counterpoint, and uh, his argument was that the um, if you are a composer, if, from the composer point of view, no matter what the what the medium you're working with, you have to always always think about the lines, because there is always one one two another. So, so when there are there, you know, you, you can you can compose on, with only one idea. You have to compose with at least two, at least two or more ideas. When there are ideas are uh, thrown into together in the, in a compositional space, you do have to think about lines, and that's counterpoint. And then uh, I learned a lot, you know, uh, 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 from what he was talking about this counterpoint, starting with the you know very general sense. Although I'm not a, I'm not a note based composer. But the I, I do believe I think that uh, you you are right that the uh, counterpoint as a concept, but also in practice, is really essential for for many musicians, whether they are composer or not. Yes, um, there's a uh, many theorists in the Renaissance wrote about exactly that sort of question, and there's one, for example, um, Ramos de Parea, who is writing I think in 1482, who um, talks about. Uh, um, when you are writing a melody against another melody, and uh, that initially counterpoint was often taught against pre-existing melodies, the cantus firmus. So you're given a melody in a mode, and then you're adding another melody. And he talks about the importance of making sure that the melody that you are adding has a, a coherence of its own and also corresponds to, uh, to the mode that you're writing in. And he gives uh, very good examples of melodies that work in a technical sense, in a vertical sense, but then don't end up having a good coherence of their own. So it's certainly something that is, uh, um, was a high priority for the, for the musicians of the time. And, uh, when you think about it in a very controlled environment, such as in Renaissance Counterpoint, then you start to see, oh, how every little thing you do ends up having consequences 
on every other level of the music. Right. And that, I suppose, is one of the big takeaway lessons from, mm. from, from Counterpoint in that sense. Right. So the, uh, so uh, could, you, uh, could you tell the, uh, the students that uh, what kind of qualities uh, do you think that do they, uh, they need uh, uh, in order for them to succeed if, uh, at a start in your, in your uh, course? But in more in general sense, uh, if they are, uh, if they are aspiring uh, musicologists, and who are particularly maybe has some interest in, although uh, probably they don't know much about early music, for example, because that's your specialty. And what do what kind of quality do they need? How how do they how do they start? I suppose in the biggest sense, what you need is you need to uh, really love music, and you need to have a, um, a a sense of curiosity about music and about also learning how how music is put together, how music. Uh, relates to the people that perform it or that hear it or that think about it or that experience it in some way in society. So you need to be interested both in the music as, as a thing of its own, but also in the music in a much bigger sense in the way that it uh, fits within, within its social context. Mm. So um, I guess you have to love music and you also have to have to love people to a certain extent. <laughs> Um, more particularly for counterpoint, I think you have to have an an openness to trying things, maybe an openness to doing things that you might find scary. So, for example, I ask people to do a little bit of singing. It's not a voice lesson. It's not a concert. It's just that fundamentally counterpoint is about the voice, about and, and also about instruments, of course, but fundamentally about the voice and about, about um, you as a person making a sound with your, with your own body. I think it's interesting that the, uh, the, you, you, uh, you encourage students to uh, try out and, uh, 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 and find the freedom within the perhaps the most rigid system they'll be working with. So that's, uh, in, a, in a way, it's a... It's a it's, it's a conflict, but at the same time, it's a, that limited, you know, there, if there is a lim limitation, then I think that the creativity is actually thrives. I think you're absolutely right about that. When I was a, a, a composition student, actually, I found it most difficult in free composition courses, essentially when people said, well, write whatever you want. And, and I was sort of, well, well, I don't really know what I want to write. But when, when I was given parameters, then within those parameters, I could, I could become very creative. As I, as I mentioned briefly, the, you are uh, you're a musicologist, and you're a musicologist uh, or the, who is interested in early music and, uh, and another you know, term, terminology called computational mus musicology. So could you tell us a little bit uh, uh, briefly about uh, your research, research and, and what is early music? What is, uh, what is the comp computational musicology? Okay, so early music, uh, it's a very interesting thing because we're kind of encroaching on everybody's territory these days. Um, I guess sort of conventionally early music gets thought of to be music of sort of Bach and earlier. Um, but uh, my own area is mainly in the 15th and 16th centuries, where I study performance and compositional practice. And these two in the time, since so much music at the time is actually improvised or comes out of improvisational practice, um, compositional and performance practice overlap quite a bit. Um, so performance practice is, in that period, uh, trying to find out about how music was performed, really. And uh, this can extend from finding out about musical instruments and how they were played, or techniques that people used, such as ornamentation, or um, a vocal technique, or in my case, even the particular notes that people played. So there's a practice of um, notating, uh, or not notating rather, the sharps and flats that apply to the music. This is called musica ficta. And the idea was that a musician of the time would know what they're meant to do. There were conventions, 
but because they're conventions, they didn't tend to write it down. And um, so the idea was, okay, maybe this keyboard notation tells us more precisely, but there's so much music that to find patterns in all this music and do so by hand would be, you can't see the forest for the trees. So this is where computers can be very, very helpful because computers are really dumb and do exactly what you tell them to, but are very, very good at then when you tell them to look for patterns at finding those patterns and at representing them in a way that, that people can then interact with. So that's where I started and I'm, I'm still very interested in computational musicology where much of it is around encoding music and finding patterns, either known or unknown patterns, and then representing them in some way that makes sense for the user. So those are kind of the two areas I work in. I'm interested in performance practice because I'm a performer. So fundamentally, if I want to know how to perform pieces or how people performed pieces so that I can relate to that and interpret that in some way, then I have to study performance practice. And then uh, computational musicology is an enormously powerful tool that helps us uh, to do that. So I'm interested in that as well. Excellent. So this, uh, so it sounds like uh, the, your course at uh, Renaissance Counterpoint could be uh, potentially challenging for uh, you know, our students, but it's at the same time, at the same time, it's just so so much fundamental that they will get they will get to learn a lot. And then you, as a researcher, have uh, this uh, very interesting. A uh, 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 the combination of a fusion of the early music and computational musicology. I think this, this will uh, give uh, some ideas for some students who are developing their final final project, perhaps. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, if if people are interested, at some point in the fall, I'll be giving um, one of the uh, the postgraduate research gyms on oh, the uh, topic yes. topic of interdisciplinary research. And that's uh, a my... that's a uh, uh, research gym is the one that uh, regularly organized by the uh, by the school. Uh, so then all PGT and PGR students come together and uh, discuss the ideas and so on. So it's an excellent opportunity. Yeah, they're on sort of different. Uh, a lot of them are sort of on different uh, hot topics or different um, uh, different methods that people use. And uh, and uh, in and the nice thing is they bring together people from all areas of the school, so you get to hear ideas from people that are working in film or in literature or in linguistics, and uh, and see how they might apply to your to your own field. Mm. And um, excellent. Yeah. yeah. So so I encourage people to go th to those as well. They get. Um, organized by Amy, who's the, uh, yes. the who's postgraduate the director of a PG, uh, yes. PG <laughs> studies. Excellent. So uh, it's it's all. I mean, the, you know, the, there is so much to talk about, and uh, I'm sure that there was students join us, and uh, they will they will run to your office. Oh, although in this case that we don't have ah. a, a <laughs> physical <laughs> office yet, but virtually they will run to you and then uh, talk to you about uh, some some crazy ideas. So thank you so much for taking your, take your time, and so. Uh, it'll be it'll be an excellent year. Yeah, I really hope so. So okay. welcome everyone. <laughs>